These are unusual times, and this is an unusual location for tonight's program. It's my back deck. Like many of you, I'm working from home, not because I'm sick or in isolation, but to distance myself while Andrew works in the studio. We're doing what we can to help stem the spread of COVID-19, but somehow, somewhere, we'll always be here with you and for you. This is The National. Enough is enough. Go home and stay home. A stern warning from the Prime Minister, take social distancing seriously or else. Also tonight, a BC woman who lost her mother to the coronavirus speaks out from isolation. I wouldn't wish this on anybody. It isn't the way you want your family member to go. Her powerful message for Canadians about taking this virus seriously. Ontario and Quebec shut down non-essential businesses. This was a very, very tough decision, but it is the right decision. What stays open, what will close, and is it enough to stop the spread? And social distancing tips from a pro. Take care of yourself, take care of your family, take care of your friends. If he can do it for months in space, we can do it too. We've watched the COVID-19 outbreak grow in Canada for weeks, but today some stark numbers show it may be kicking into a higher gear. Four more people have died and Canada has now shot well past 2,000 cases, a number almost double that of just three days ago. Canada's two biggest provinces are now the ones with the highest caseloads. Quebec reported a tidal wave of new cases today. It and Ontario will basically be shut down by tomorrow night. Non-essential businesses were told to close up shop to slow the spread, and the Prime Minister delivered a blunt message for the entire country. It's time for all Canadians to recognize how deadly serious this is and stay home. The Prime Minister, among many Canadians, frustrated with those not following protocols, and as David Cochran reports, even tougher measures could come soon. The Prime Minister has spent weeks trying to reassure Canadians. Now he's warning the ones who aren't listening. We've all seen the pictures online of people who seem to think they're invincible. Well, you're not. Enough is enough. Go home and stay home. These pictures at a Vancouver beach are said to have made the Prime Minister particularly angry, as these normal signs of spring are a big sign of trouble people ignoring public health advice. We need to slow and stop the spread of this virus if we are going to come through this uh, strongly as a country uh, without losing too many of our loved ones. Avoid crowded places. And to drive it all home, the first of a series of ads to push public health advice that is acutely important for people in acute settings. To protect the health workers at risk of being overrun. To keep the virus out of long-term care homes where Canada has has seen the most deaths, even to keep essential services like grocery stores running. Not knowing is no excuse. Listening is your duty and staying home is your way to serve. It's a message all governments especially want the snowbirds to hear as they fly home from the winter. It is essential that they don't stop for groceries, that they don't visit their friends or family on the way home, that they're not stopping anywhere, but going directly home and doing so safely. Go directly home and stay in your house. You're putting thousands and thousands of people at risk. It's the toughest language to date with the threat of tougher enforcement measures if people still don't listen. To this point, Ottawa has left the hammer in the hands of the provinces, many of whom are happy to swing it. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. So despite aggressive messaging campaigns, too many Canadians still not doing their part to slow the spread. Alison Northcott takes a closer look at the battle for compliance. Police directed traffic for this COVID-19 drive through testing site in Montreal. One way officers are involved in the fight against the virus. They're also enforcing social distancing rules, fielding 200 911 calls since Saturday from people reporting social gatherings the province has ordered to stop. On one hand, uh, we don't want people to start calling and, you know, say, ah, oh, my neighbor's taking a walk with, uh, and there's two people. But on the other hand, when people call, it shows that they're becoming conscious. 
Montreal police say they do have the power to make arrests, but hope it doesn't come to that. But in Quebec City, police did arrest a woman for defying a quarantine order last week. We would be relying on the discretion of our bylaw officers. Vancouver City Council passed a motion today allowing the city to fine businesses and individuals who defy state of emergency rules. On the weekend when I saw people playing soccer, uh, having picnics, uh, you know, in the basketball courts, playing, playing hockey, it was a nice day, uh, playing beer pong, can you imagine? Uh, so I said to council, we have to act. Other provinces, including Nova Scotia and Ontario, are also using the threat of fines to ensure people comply. There was a, a police cruiser going by and he was using his loudspeakers and his microphone uh, telling a number of pedestrians to stay six feet apart. We're encouraging and promoting compliance. Obviously, we don't want, don't want to get into, you know, uh, giving people tickets, but if that's what needs to be done, then that's what we'll have to do. The people are getting the message. A small group are ignoring the message. Ontario Premier Doug Ford says convincing them is not just up to police. Follow the rules. And uh, we see businesses open. I won't hesitate to call them out by name. Police hope they won't have to resort to fines and that people will listen and follow public health orders. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. So let's take a closer look at the latest COVID-19 numbers in Canada. There are now at least 2,092 reported cases. That's an increase of 620 from yesterday. Quebec stands out with a huge spike of 409. In a few minutes, we'll explain how that province has changed how it counts cases. But Ontario is up by 79, BC by 48, and Alberta by 42. Across the country, people are getting sick. Tina Lovegreen looks at who they are. Teresa Comey says her mother never liked to be the center of attention. If she's looking down, she'll be like, Teresa, please stop talking. Um, because she was so private. But she's speaking about the 89-year-old, the introvert with the heart of an artist, because she died from COVID-19 while at the Lynn Valley Care Centre. That you wouldn't want something like that to happen to anybody that you knew, let alone a person that you loved. Because you're 100% helpless. You're 100% powerless in the situation. The situation is, and you have to navigate it. But there's a bigger message to share. To look around and see people not taking it seriously and until each person has touched themselves by um, a family member they can't understand the enormity of this entire situation. Most of those who have died in Canada have been elderly largely in their 70s and 80s at least 15 of the country's 24 fatalities were residents of three seniors care facilities in BC and Quebec. A man in his 60s died in Edmonton and the youngest known death was an Ontario man in his 50s with an underlying health condition. At least 40 patients are fighting the virus in intensive care units across the country. It's very dangerous and we don't know how far it can go. Jyoti Chaudhry's husband, Jay, is one of them. The 52-year-old pastor has viral pneumonia and has been in the hospital in Calgary since Wednesday. And they tell me, Mom, why you are so stressed out? Why you are so stressed out? Baba is in a good hand. The entire family has tested positive for the virus, meaning they can't visit him in the hospital. It puts all this complexity around their passing. And there won't be a funeral for Teresa Comey's mother, at least not for a few more months. It feels terrible to mourn somebody um, in isolation. That's the added cruelty of the virus, having to stay away when you want to get together the most. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, North Vancouver, B.C. As we said, the number of new cases in Quebec today is jarring. It nearly tripled its case count in just a day. But the fear is a bigger surge is still to come. Christine Birak with how hospitals across Canada are gearing up for what's coming. We can see today an important increase in the number of cases. It didn't happen overnight, but it's a huge jump from over 200 confirmed cases to more than 600. The tally now includes positive test results from all hospital-run labs in Quebec. Before today, some of those cases required a second verification test. But a surge in cases means people aren't keeping their distance from one another, and the virus is spreading. Outside of healthcare, this is kind of a weird inconvenience. It's an odd time, uh, but for us, this is actually very scary. 
Based on Canadian case reports so far, 6% of COVID-19 cases have been hospitalized. Staff are now caring for about 120 patients and counting. For a 20-day stay in hospital, caring for a single patient requires about 100 pairs of gloves, masks and gowns. Hospitals are calling on anyone with unused supplies to hand them over. We know there's lots of personal protective equipment in the community. Uh, dentists, veterinarians, nail salons, construction sites, pest control, etc. And we know the community wants to help. University researchers are answering that call. The danger in a clinical setting is that uh, as they get low on these supplies, they have to start reusing them. You'll need diapers. Or making their own. In some American cities, they're already running out. We're about 10 days away from our public health system not being able uh, to support coronavirus patients. Health Canada says it has secured millions of masks that should be arriving shortly. Still, there's concern that as a surge in patients starts, it won't be enough. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, let's bring in Dr. Isaac Bogosh now, an infectious disease specialist. So, Dr. Bogosh, this surge, I mean, when does it peak and, and how big does it get? It's really hard to know, and a lot of that's going to depend on how we do as Canadians with our social or physical distancing measures. And if we really take this seriously, and we actually all abide by these principles, we can certainly limit the surge of cases that we're going to be seeing in Canada. Okay, but that there continues to be sort of clear examples of people out there who aren't following the guidelines or, or who aren't taking it as seriously as others. What is, what is the realistic consequence of that? Yeah, I mean, truly, if we don't, if we don't all abide by these principles, we're going to see more and more community transmission, and we're going to see a, a greater number of new cases per day, day after day. I should also remind people, too, that some of these new cases are, are really because we're seeing more diagnostic test kits available and a loosening of the restrictions on who can get tested. And as these test kits roll out, we're going to start to make more diagnosis. And we're also, not only is this going to be reflective of sick people in hospital, but this is going to be reflective of uh, people who are not that sick, who are in uh, home or community settings as well. So that might also be contributing to the greater number of cases we're seeing. Right. That's an important point to note. Uh, Dr. Bogosh, thanks so much. Anytime. Now, as we mentioned, the two biggest provinces, Ontario and Quebec, have announced near total shutdowns, drastic measures to fight the spread. Ellen Morrow takes us through it. We must get ahead of this virus to beat this virus. And getting ahead, Ontario's premier said, means shutting down. This was a very, very tough decision. But it is the right decision. This is not the time for half measures. Starting midnight tomorrow, non-essential businesses in the province will be closed. Remaining open, grocery stores, pharmacies, takeouts and liquor stores. Cutting access to alcohol, authorities say, would cause problems. You know, whether we care to admit it or not, there are many people in our community who have significant dependence issues. Hardware stores will also stay open. Andrew Rotblatt has put in strict distancing measures at his store in downtown Toronto. We're limiting it to one or two customers at a time and, you know, everybody seems to be complying with the sanitizer when they walk in. Ontario follows PEI and today Quebec. Francois Legault explained the lockdown like this. We put chances on our side that it goes better after. So I think that in doing more than less, it's helping everybody. Wise words, says this infectious diseases specialist. Everybody knows what to do. And they gave us a chance. And, uh, you know, some people kind of blew it, didn't, uh, didn't act the way that they were supposed to. I think that resulted in, in this lockdown, which I think is, is t totally appropriate. They go to that dark place. The announcement of the lockdown prompted Susan Nagy to go shopping. I think it's going to be a weird new normal for people and I think that there's going to have to be a lot of adjustment. Adjustment and isolation, the reality of living with COVID-19. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. So COVID-19 having a major impact as provinces and cities look to manage the virus. Anita Bath is tracking stories from communities across Canada for us. Anita. 
Andrew, that non-essential business shutdown in Quebec Ellen just spoke about, well, it caused a lot of confusion today. It wasn't clear what might stay open and what might close, so long lines formed outside grocery, liquor and cannabis stores as people rushed to stock up. Turns out those stores will in fact stay open. Now in Ontario, the province's schools are rescheduled to open in two weeks, but today a change of heart. Do I believe and does the minister believe uh, April 6th kids are going back to school? Uh, the kids won't be going back to school on April the 6th. But again, this, this is changing hour by hour, day by day. Now there are still thousands of people returning back to Canada and that has Ottawa taxi drivers sounding the alarm. They are often the first point of contact when someone leaves the airport. Taxi drivers are now waiting to see if they end up getting designated as an essential service by the government. When I finish from here, when I go to my house with my kid, how am I going to stay with my kid? My kid is worried about 24 hours when I'm outside, but I have to work. I have a mortgage, I have a kid, I need a food. So, but the company doesn't do anything for me. A quick look at Nova Scotia. Checkpoints have now sprung up at every major entry point into the province. That means highways, ferries, airports, everything is being patrolled and everyone is being questioned. Anyone considered a non-essential worker is being told to self-isolate for 14 days, even if coming from another part of Canada. Nova Scotia has 28 positive tests that are new, bringing the total tonight to 41. And one of those is a child under 10 years old. Adrian. All right, thanks, Anita. Well, Canadian officials are trying to hammer home the importance of physical distancing. Donald Trump is considering easing restrictions in the U.S. as early as next week. So this, as the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases grew to 40,000 in the U.S. by this evening, deaths jumped past 500, and mayors and governors across the country are still pleading for help. As Paul Hunter tells us, the U.S. president really wants Americans to get back to work. This is not a country that was built for this. It was not built to be shut down. Hinting that his own guidelines encouraging social distancing are in turn slamming the U.S. economy, Donald Trump today suggested he may be about to rescind those guidelines. America will again and soon be open for business, uh, very soon, a lot sooner than... Uh, three or four months. We're not going to let the cure be worse than the problem. Said Trump tonight, a decision on whether to ease up will come in about a week. But as mega lineups continue for corona testing, U.S. hospitals brace for being flat out overwhelmed, not least after a blunt new prediction from the Surgeon General. I want America to understand this week it's going to get bad. In hard-hit New York today, a giant convention center was being turned into a makeshift federal hospital. And some worry if Trump now promotes a prompt restart for U.S. businesses, the resulting closer social interaction will only make things worse. Still, tonight, Trump seemed optimistic. People have learned social distancing, he said. Hot spots can be monitored. Supplies are being stepped up. We're having millions and millions of masks made as we speak. He had a warning for those hoarding supplies or selling fake tests. The Department of Justice will be aggressively prosecuting fraudulent schemes. And he highlighted the start of testing for that malaria drug he's promoted as a possible treatment. It would be a gift from God if that worked. That would be a big game changer. Trump, who's often called this the Chinese virus, said it's important the U.S. Asian community be protected, adding this isn't their fault. And on the health risks in reopening the economy, Trump seemed to call for perspective. He said lots of people die in car crashes every year. That doesn't mean there's no more driving. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. More signs tonight. The 2020 Olympic Games simply cannot go on as planned. Next on The National, Canadian athletes put Olympic dreams on hold. I know there's so many people, this was their last Olympics, this was their last go, and you kind of just have to just hurt for them. And we put your questions to the doctors, including this one. If I've mainly been staying at home alone, is it safe to meet up with other people who've also been staying home alone? I guess I'm overwhelmed. And tips for parents now suddenly turned teachers for those kids stuck at home, we're back into.
Welcome back. As we continue our coverage of the coronavirus pandemic, the British Prime Minister has issued a stern new order. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. Boris Johnson says people should only go out for the following reasons, for food or medicine, to exercise once a day, to provide or receive medical care, or to travel to and from work if it's absolutely necessary. He also ordered all non-essential shops to close and threatened fines for those who do not comply. So Olympic committees of the U.S. and Australia are now following Canada's lead. They, too, are now calling on the International Olympic Committee to postpone the Tokyo Games. As, Demi, as Jamie Strachan tells us, it seems Japan is considering that possibility. Noelle Montcalm. Hurdler Noelle Montcalm is also a registered nurse and understands why the Canadian Olympic Committee isn't sending athletes to Japan. We don't even know what you know, the next weeks to months even even look like right now. So, I mean, disheartening to say the least, but a right decision. Canada's move comes as the International Olympic Committee faces intense pressure to postpone these games. The United States is now also calling for a postponement. So too is Australia. Hurdler Sage Watson supports Canada's choice, but understands why the IOC wants more time. Somebody from the IOC messaged me and they said this is like a Tetris game. Um, there's so many moving parts and there's so many things to figure out. Longtime IOC member Canadian Dick Pound suggested today the games will likely be pushed back to July 2021. Even the Japanese are having doubts. <laughs> With Prime Minister Shinzo Abe today finally acknowledging a postponement was on the table. Diana Matheson, part of the Canadian soccer team that qualified to compete in Tokyo, says it's been impossible to properly prepare as athletes try to socially isolate. We as Olympians are trying to take steps to lead and doing the right things. Work out at home, work out in your dens, go on solo runs, but please stop playing soccer in the parks with, with 20 people. I'm not playing soccer, you shouldn't be either. As the IOC figures out how or when these games will take place, Sage Watson says it's a tough time for everyone. I know there's so many people, this was their last Olympics, this was their last go, and you kind of just have to just hurt for them. But the Canadian Olympic Committee says these times are different. A time for empty stadiums and a time to put the Olympics on hold. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, in just a few moments' time, our team of doctors are going to take on the questions that you have been sending us, including this one. How will this virus eventually stop? Does it just die out and disappear? We're back in a moment, but first, this. For many, like Montreal Canadiens' Thomas Tatar, the absence of pro sports is tough. But athletes, commentators and fans are now getting creative to beat the COVID-19 isolation blues. From England's probably short-lived social distancing soccer league. Well, this is the final of the two lonely blokes in a park contest. And, whoa, that was absolutely terrible. A few runners in the distance, not keeping enough distance, frankly. To feline martial arts. It's a butt punch by Winston. Butt punch. And now it's sniffing. Now we're holding. Staring contest is now in progress. And hey, there's Toronto Raptor Serge Ibaka's exciting world of competitive dishwasher loading. If you've got a great isolation boredom killing video, email us at the national at cbc.ca. Welcome back. COVID-19 is driving an incredible amount of change happening right now in our day-to-day -day lives. And that has led to a ton of questions about how to stay safe and how to stay healthy. So every night, we're turning to a team of doctors to help find some answers. With me tonight, respirologist Dr. Samir Gupta and Dr. Isaac Bogosh, an infectious disease specialist. Hello, General, and thanks again for joining us. Dr. Bogosh, Hello. let's start with this first question. And this is one, I got to say, that we've gotten an awful lot. Here it is. Should you be social distancing from your own partner or your own spouse if you live in the same house but are still going to work regularly, still going outside? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a judgment call. And I think that uh, different people have different risk thresholds. And of course, if you're both very, very careful at your place of work, and you're both being mindful of, of hand hygiene, and you're both clearly without any symptoms, you know, many people are choosing to have some degree of normalcy in their life and still maintaining the same household relationship that they did before this. Certainly, some other people are choosing not to do that. And, and that's okay. Uh, and some people are, have been sleeping in separate bedrooms. But I, I really think that it's, it's totally reasonable to have some sense of normalcy in, in, in the relationship at home. And if both people are completely healthy and well, I think that's totally fine. Okay, Dr. Dr. Gupta, this next question is about what happens once you get home. So do I need to wash my hands regularly and repeatedly while I'm at home or only after I've had contact with the outside world? Yeah, I mean, theoretically, the, the time that it's most important is when you've had contact with the outside world. Uh, but even if you haven't had that contact, uh, it's, it's a great habit to get into. And, you know, don't forget that there are other infections than COVID-19. So it's, it's a good habit to get into to protect yourself against all sorts of infections. Right. Fair enough. And, and I suppose odds are you're much more likely to get sick from those other infections than COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Bogosh, next question for you. If I've mainly been staying at home alone, is it safe to meet up with other people who've also been staying home alone? You know, the short answer is we really shouldn't be doing that. And really, we've heard time and time again from our senior public health leadership that we've got to stay home, uh, spread out. Uh, but having said that, I think it's totally okay for people to, you know, get some fresh air, uh, go outside for a walk, as long as you keep your distance from other people. So if two people want to maybe go for a walk together, but they're far apart from each other and they want to go outside and get some fresh air, that's, that's totally reasonable. But, you know, I think the real key thing is no congregations of uh, groups of people. And even if there's two people together, let's keep that two meter distance. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gupta, this is about the two meter distance, especially for people who live in condo buildings or apartment buildings. How long can this coronavirus stay airborne if someone coughs or sneezes? And I'm thinking in an elevator, say. Okay. Well, I think the first thing to be really important to clarify here is that I think there's some confusion because of a study that came out recently uh, that showed that the virus can, can actually be suspended in the air. But that was actually a study where they used a medical device called a nebulizer. So that was really not about everyday real life conditions. That was about conditions in a hospital with specific equipment. So in your everyday scenario, people coughing or sneezing, it doesn't actually get suspended in the air. It simply travels in these droplets. And these droplets will, you know, they'll hit a surface or, or they'll land on the ground, but they won't stay suspended in the air. So, you know, if you're in an elevator, uh, again, it's hard to be six feet away from someone. Uh, ideally, they should be facing in a different direction uh, when they cough or sneeze so that the droplets will go in that other direction. But I think the thing to be most mindful for, of if, in an elevator type of situation is that all those surfaces are likely contaminated, particularly the buttons. So again, it comes back to hand hygiene. Mm. Okay, Dr. Bogosh, one more question. How will this virus eventually stop? Does it just die out and disappear? Yeah, the short answer is no one really knows. And there's certainly a lot of speculation here. One of the prevailing theories is that, you know, this, there's, we're clearly in the midst of a pandemic. The virus is going to run its course. And then it'll likely circulate just on very low levels, maybe with some seasonal variability like influenza. And maybe we'll see uh, some of this virus in, in the cooler winter months. And then, uh, and then it'll go away in the summer months. And it'll just sort of pass like, uh, like influenza season, uh, like we see with influenza. No one's 100% sure, but really this hammers home the point that we really need a vaccine for this, uh, for this uh, virus, and tons and tons of efforts are being poured into creating a vaccine for this, so we have a sustainable long-term solution. All right. Dr. Bogosh, Dr. Gupta, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as we've mentioned, we will be asking your questions about COVID-19 every night going forward. So send us the questions that you have. You can message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National, or you can send us an email at thenational at cbc.ca. Information about the coronavirus is changing so fast it can be hard to keep up and even harder sometimes to sort out fact from fiction. But CBC News has you covered. We've assembled a new team called COVID Check. Tonight, Katie Nicholson examines a wild claim spreading online that the virus is caused by the next generation of wireless technology. Viruses are simply excretions of a toxic cell. That's Thomas Cowan, an American Viruses holistic doctor. They butt out from the cell. They happen when the cell is poisoned. 
They are not the cause of anything. In this video that's been shared thousands of times around the world in five different languages, Cowan claims a virus isn't behind the pandemic. 5G wireless networks are. Anybody want to make one guess as to where the first completely blanketed 5G city in the world was. Exactly. That's not true. Some U.S. cities and South Korea had 5G networks long before Wuhan. And 5G is a long way from being up and running around the world. But the video gained traction. Last week, it was shared by American singer Carrie Hilson to her more than 2 million Instagram followers. It's actually been something that the anti-vax community has used uh, fairly frequently as part of their argument against vaccination. University of Manitoba um, so virologist not, Jason Kindrachuk uh, has heard this 5G poisoning idea before. Kindrachuk says scientists have sequenced COVID-19. They've taken it apart and put it back together again. They've infected primates with it who then exhibited symptoms. I think the data is so overwhelmingly um, uh, valid and, and validated to, to show that the viruses cause disease. Um, it's almost difficult for me to argue why. As for Thomas Cowan, he's currently on probation with the California State Medical Board and operating with restrictions on his practice after a 2017 complaint about another matter. Cowan has authored a book that argues against vaccinating children. He did not respond to CBC News's request for comment about the video. So, no, staying away from 5G networks, which we don't really have up and running in Canada yet, won't keep you safe from COVID-19. Kitty Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, next on The National, parents who suddenly become teachers. How to keep the kids learning at home. Plus, Canadian businesses answer the call and switch gears to make much needed medical supplies. Hi, uh, I'm Chris Hadfield. I've, I've spent a little time self-isolating. And some advice from a Canadian who knows a lot about living in isolation. We'll be right back. COVID-19 once again made for rough waters on stock markets today, even as the price of oil and gold ticked up. The TSX lost 632 points. That's down 5.3%. In New York, the Dow Jones was down 583 points. That's about 3%. And the S&P 500 closed down almost as much. That index has now shed all gains made during the Trump presidency. Now, in this time of need, governments have called on Canadian companies to step up and deliver crucial products that are in short supply. Aaron Saltzman looks at how some of those businesses are responding. Even before COVID-19 hit Canada, molded precision components was preparing to adapt. Production was going to start slowing down. We started trying to figure out ways that we could um, help support. They make things like gears and housings using precision instruments and 3D printing. Now, instead of auto components, they're moving into health care. Apart from having to build an entire clean room for production, it's a relatively straightforward conversion. We can produce medical components uh, speci specifically for supporting the, uh, the shortage in ventilators. Exactly the type of effort called for by the government last week. This is a coordinated strategy that will leverage our industrial base to rapidly scale towards more Canadian production. In fact, the government's strategy came after conversations with the Auto Parts Manufacturing Association. It won't make up for the 100,000 layoffs due to COVID-19, but that's not the point. We ship about $100 million worth of product a day. The, if we did a billion dollars worth of, of suppliers, of, of medical supplies, it'd be two weeks worth of business. This isn't a business replacement. This is, we're all friends and neighbors, and some of our friends and neighbors are on the front line. It's the same with other businesses, distilleries and breweries making hand sanitizer and donating the product to people in need, all the while keeping people working. MPC has just been asked to make 25 million medical masks, but that still won't make up for its regular business. And if this goes on more than six months, the company may be in trouble. For now, though, all 60 employees are still on the job, and they're even looking to hire 15 more. And we're going to need an army to take this on. Aiming to come out even stronger than when this began. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. 
Well, if that story opened a window to the strategy at some workplaces, the next one shows us a new battle for parents on the home front. Shuttered schools are presenting a potentially overwhelming challenge. Deanna Sumanak Johnson has a look at some solutions. With five kids aged 2 to 17, Olivia Gravish always has her hands full. But now she's not just mom, she is teacher too. I guess I'm overwhelmed. I don't know where to find the resources. Um, and the resources they do have, even though they have an abundance of them, I don't know what to, to actually look for. On top of that, I have four different grades to st try and teach. Her stress is shared by parents across Canada. In Ontario, homeschooling may be a reality for longer than previously thought. The kids won't be going back to school on April the 6th. Officials have put some math and literacy resources online with more to come. Alberta has a more specific plan for students to complete a certain number of hours each week. But any plan requires something Gravish doesn't have. We don't have a computer. We don't have those things and so I can't let them each sit and have their time unless they're on my phone. Some rabbits live on farms. Scholastic publishers may have one solution for that, putting resources online, no computer or Wi-Fi needed. We wanted this to be something that kids could rely on with a, you know, a family phone and a piece of paper and a pencil and they would be able to fill two to three hours of really meaningful learning time a day. Officials don't want parents to stress over perfection. We don't want to transform every single parent of Quebec into teachers. 30. How many are there? And this expert and mom of two agrees. The research tells me that talk is super important to learning. So just talk with your kids, right? And in terms of math, talk with your kids about math. We do little math games, but we also just do like mental math. Tips for parents balancing new roles while teaching their children another lesson about the importance of resilience in tough times. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Up next on The National, we take a closer look at the situation in Russia. Vladimir Putin's message to the outside world is that the Kremlin has it all under control. Inside the country, though, there's doubt. But first, some tips on self-isolating from a guy who knows a whole lot about that. Hi, uh, I'm Chris Hadfield. I've, I've spent a little time self-isolating. Chris Hadfield was an astronaut for 21 years, the first Canadian to walk in space, commander of the International Space Station. His last mission kept him in space for five months. His tips for getting through that and what's happening now? Number one, understand the actual risk. Don't just be afraid of things. Go to a credible source and find out what is truly the risk that you're facing right now. Next, he says, choose some goals, assess your limitations, and then act. Start doing things. They don't have to be the things that you always did before. Take care of family, start a new project, learn to play guitar, study another language, read a book, write, create. So take care of yourself, take care of your family, take care of your friends, take care of your spaceship. And I wish everybody happy landings. For breaking news and COVID-19 updates, CBC News Network is now free. And for more ways to watch, stream live coverage at cbc.ca, cbcgem, cbcnews.ca, and on the CBC News app. I'm Michelle Shepard, filling in for Jamie Poisson. Tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, an unlikely group on the front lines of Canada's coronavirus response, grocery store workers, and the risks that they weigh for a paycheck. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We are tracking several international coronavirus stories for you. Italy registered more than 4,700 new coronavirus cases today and 602 new deaths. Lower numbers for the second straight day, though officials say it's too soon to call it a trend. This crematorium in the north has been inundated with coffins. Workers there say they're trying to give every victim a proper burial, but they can't keep up. Yesterday, the government banned travel within the country and froze all non-essential businesses. And in France, health officials are reporting 186 new deaths, bringing the total to 860. 
The military set up medical tents in the hard-hit region of Alsace to ease the burden on hospitals there. This one will be able to accommodate up to 30 critically ill patients at a time. Meantime, the country is enforcing strict measures to slow the spread. Today, popular tourist locations around Paris were nearly deserted, and police officers were stopping drivers and pedestrians to make sure that they had documentation allowing them to be there. Russia, meanwhile, is a different story. It's got a population of nearly 150 million. It shares a land border with Europe and China, and yet has reported just 438 cases of coronavirus. The government claims its measures are working, but inside Russia, there is doubt. Chris Brown has that story. The handout video from Russian health authorities projects a country beating back the coronavirus at the airport and on Moscow's metro. The message from Vladimir Putin is that Russia isn't like Europe. The situation is under control, he said. Indeed, Orthodox parishioners are so confident or oblivious that until a few days ago they were lining up to kiss church icons without even wiping them down. We have thousands of coronavirus in Russia, but nobody knows uh, exactly how much. Dr. Anastasia Vasileva, who heads a doctor's union, says physicians have been telling her cases of coronavirus are being deliberately mislabeled by health authorities as pneumonia to keep the numbers low. Well, I think that is, uh, they really don't want to, to tell truth and they uh, mean coronavirus but say pneumonia. <laughs> Ordinary Russians seem torn about what to believe. The Bolshoi theater is closed, but shopping malls are not. And the metro is fully operating. And over the weekend, Russia sent nine plane loads of doctors, specialists, and equipment to Italy to help out there, as if to underscore the Kremlin's claim that it's doing so well it can spare the resources. At the city's coronavirus call center, where the operators seem to sit pretty close together, this worker told us she's not answered any panicked calls. And I think that they follow all uh, our recommendations. Then again, the government is also moving quickly to build a new infectious disease hospital in Moscow with hundreds of beds, presumably because it's expecting a lot of new cases. Russia's government said today that anyone 65 years or older should stay inside and not go out. Everyone, that is, except for President Vladimir Putin. He's 67, but the Kremlin says the new rule doesn't apply to him. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. All right, coming up, a creative way to bring some cheer while physical distancing. The story behind this next in our moment. This piper wanted to do something special to help those struggling in the midst of the coronavirus. So he threw a concert in front of a retirement home, keeping socially, physically distanced and all. They opened the doors and windows to let the music in, and that's our moment. I played the, played the bagpipes for many years and just thought uh, it'd be nice to try and lift their spirits. I know my Nana, um, she's 94, just passed last year, but she loved the bagpipes. I mean, I knew, knew they, I couldn't go inside, but at least I could play outside. It's one, one instrument where you can certainly... Uh, let it rip outside. They could open up their windows, and uh, they'd enjoy it. It was it was heartwarming for everyone in the village. I did it just for the residents to get some entertainment. A couple people held the front doors open. They kept wanting to close, but they eventually just held them right open so that the sound would go in. It put a, a good feeling to me. In, into me, yeah. brought back memories of World War II. It's from heaven. <laughs> you feel kind of useless, and I thought, you know, this is something that I can give back and just, uh, you know, lift their spirits, hopefully, and I think it uh, served its purpose. And I did call him to tell him he's famous now. <laughs> <laughs> Good for him. So it's funny, you can just sort of imagine that scene. He's talking about the doors, Andrew, so they're automatic doors that close, and they kept closing, and some people kept waving their arms in front of them, they close <laughs> again. So uh, any, anything they could to let the music in. Yeah, well, and it just goes to show you, right, that there are so many ways to, to help people to support people maybe you know a song maybe you can run an errand or maybe you just hold the door open uh, that's the national for this march 23rd have a good night